I'm going to get into the journey in a minute, but I didn't ever envisage that I'd be stood here at 28 years service saying that I crashed and burned and did some things very wrongly, actually, in terms of looking after my health. Uh, but I did. So having been through that experience, the reason why I want to share my journey and share the learning and share all the tools is so that nobody sitting in this room has to end up where I ended up because I wouldn't wish where I ended up on my worst enemy, probably. I'm going to move it on. I'm just going to set a bit of context. These are four pictures of me. That one at the top left looks pretty awful, I've got to say. Uh, that was in January 2020, and that was about 10 months before I would say I kind of got to the point where I knew I couldn't go on and I couldn't cope anymore. And uh, September 2020 was when I hit my 50th birthday. And, you know, you could say, oh, midlife crisis. You're hitting, 20, you know, you're hitting your 50th birthday. I knew I wasn't very well at this point. And I kept thinking, if I can just get to my 50th birthday and I can just get a holiday, I'm going to be OK. But the reality was that wasn't the case. Uh, I got to my 50th birthday, got just beyond my 50th birthday, and two very close friends, both very senior leaders in this organisation, had started to pick up that I wasn't right, that I wasn't well. One I've known 28 years, well, almost 28 years, the other I've known 13. And they both kind of put their arms around me and they were kind of saying, Marie, you need some time out, you, you're not well, There's, you're not good. And I was like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. Because we do, don't we? We say we're fine when maybe we might not be fine. Bottom left is uh, February 2021. It was about four months after, I'd, three months after I'd gone sick. And then sept 20, September 2021, you can see, come on, it's pretty dr dramatic difference in, in the picture. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a career snapshot. I'm gonna give you a bit about the lead up. I'm gonna tell you what it felt like to be in that dark and alien place. I'm gonna give you the things that I discovered to help me recover and that holistic approach and then talking about how you build resilience and how you establish new patterns. Is that okay? Are you all with me? Okay, it's a bit of a science lesson. Any scientists in the room? Anybody do science at university? You're not going to open up, are you now, even if you did? Anybody interested in science? A little bit? Okay, so these two systems govern basically everything that our body, our hormones, our brain, everything, how things work. You didn't think, did you, today, about making your heart beat when you got up. Well, hopefully your heartbeat was beating overnight because otherwise you wouldn't be here this morning if it had stopped beating. <laughs> but we don't think about those things, do we? We don't think about the things that our nervous system, and I put all that information up there and you can have a look at it or go research it later. But we are very finely balanced as human beings in terms of both our nervous system and our endocrine system. And you're thinking, why is she talking about this? Because this is really the basis of, of our resilience. And different things in our lives, different stimuli, different things that come into our, our arena, our experiences day to day, will impact on how this functions, effectively or not effectively, manages our stress levels, manages all the hormone balance that sits behind that. That gets very complicated for women, especially when we reach our 40s. Sometimes it's earlier, but late 40s, early 50s when we hit menopause, because that whole hormonal thing begins to be a bit unregulated and we begin to lose important hormones, oestrogen, testosterone, that actually affect our ability to function and to manage stress. Now, I didn't know any of that before I got sick. I I've learnt all this afterwards. And the reason I've learnt it all afterwards is because I'm a Y person. Have we got any Y people in the room today? Come on, you're a bit of a passive audience. Who, who likes the why in life? Who looks at why things happen? Yeah, some of you do. A lot, a lot of people are what people, a lot of people are how people. I'm definitely a why person, so I wanted to understand. So how did I break and how might any of us break? Well, it's the accumulation, I would say, of multiple different and complex factors which eventually take their toll on our nervous system, which undermines our mental, our physical and our emotional resilience to function on any meaningful level, look after ourselves, relationships or work. Okay, that's my definition of how we might break. What kind of things do you think, this is the audience participation bit, what, do you, what kind of things do you think might impact on our nervous system, might impact on our ability to function? They're really basic things. 
Lack of sleep. Yeah, lack of sleep, lack of exercise. Bad eating. Bad eating. Yeah. Stress. Stress. What causes stress? Work. Work. <laughs> yeah. What else causes stress? Relationships. Relationships. Good. This is now you come in. These are the things. These are the things. Relationships. Debt. Debt. Yeah. Self imposed expectation almost on your, you know, that you set yourself up to. Yeah. Self. Achieve. Self. Yeah. Setting high expectations of yourself. Yeah. Environmental factors like lockdown and stuff like that. Environmental factors, bereavement, trauma, anything that affects our emotional sort of stability and energy could cause us to get to a place where we break down. I'm going to show you a chart in a bit of how that kind of thing works. And actually stress is a good thing and a bad thing. So, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But those factors could, would be different for all of us. So I'm going to share the factors that made me break, but then the factors that could cause you to come to a point, you know, where you feel like you can't go on, would be potentially different factors. And, and what I suppose I want to stand here and say as well, that I am not here to say, oh, I've got all this sus, because I haven't. And once you've gone through a journey like I've gone through, you have to then learn about how you're going to manage stuff kind of moving forward. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what I want to try and do is help you identify as SIOs, because I think SIOs are in some of the most difficult and challenging spaces in policing in terms of the amount of trauma you're seeing but all, and working through and managing and looking at, but also just all the demands within the whole policing kind of context and framework. You are exposed to some stuff that other police officers aren't exposed to. That's the truth. You're exposed to some horrific things. Those of us that have investigated homicides, you know, how many, how many post-mortems have you been to? I've been to a lot of post-mortems. How many of you remember post-mortems that you've been to? I remember quite a few post-mortems I've been to. That is trauma that is, that potentially is pushed down into your background that you are not even aware of, but it's in your subconscious space. So you need to be aware of that. And there is no shame or stigma. That's the other reason why I'm sharing my story. There is no shame or stigma about saying, actually, I just need some time out, or I need to do something different for a bit, or actually, I need some help to work through some of this. Because if any of you are dreaming about stuff, I know I've gone a bit off piece here, but if any of you are dreaming about stuff that is in the workspace that is unhealthy, you know, if you're getting those things visiting you, either in your memories or when you're asleep, your brain isn't able to file it. That's why it's coming out in your thoughts, your imagination, or in your sleep. And if your brain isn't filing it, that is trauma that is, uh, you know, just niggling away in the background and, and eating away in the background. And that is something that you, that you should seek to get some help with. Okay, so the lead up. Lots of trauma context, I've talked about that, throughout my service, 28 years in, in a couple of months time. Work demands, I've been on an SLT since March 2005. So that's, at this point, was nearly 15 years. Lots of intensity around SIO roles, TFC roles, all the way through that period of time. Now, I, I loved all that. I love it. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm going back to being accredited as a firearms commander quite soon. And I love the operational space. But, but what it was probably doing in the background to some of my system wasn't healthy because I wasn't managing other areas healthily. And that's what we'll share. I'll share today. Long hours. We've all been in that space, you know, from what, one uh, role to another role. Uh, critical threat and risk, you know, and he's touched on some of that. Some of the stuff I picked up, actually, you know, those reputational issues, those things affect you. You know, how do you appear in the media? SIOs do appear in the media. You know, what, what's the perception of me in the public space? People can Google you. you. You've got all of that external stuff going on as well as the stuff internally. And then I went into the CTU and I had a, a, large, um, a large portfolio um, and at the point where I was starting to become quite unwell, physically and probably emotionally with all the perimenopause symptoms, I ended up leading a team and I had no chief inspectors. And I had this portfolio and there were no chief inspectors because one had gone sick and the other one had been moved. So I had two, basically it was me and the teams. And I tried, I mean now looking back, I just think well, I was stupid. I just should have said, I'm not doing this anymore. But we don't, do we? 
You know, we don't, we don't turn around to a boss and go, do you know what, I can't actually manage this. You go, all oh, right, I can do this. I'm going to manage it like, I'm going to manage it by doing this. I'm going to manage it by doing that. And I'm going to cope. But because I didn't realise the effect of the perimenopausal stuff on my nervous system, I didn't realise that my cortisol levels and all of that kind of stuff was all over the place, I just kept going. I kept going. And um, I was obviously doing stuff outside of work as well. And I had lots of healthy lifestyle components, but I just kept going. And then in May 2020, I had this episode of what they call thrombophlebitis. These are the perimenopausal symptoms. Some of you will be familiar with these and some of you won't. So I'll just put them up there and you can have a little look. And for those of you that are guys in the room who are married or you've got a female partner or anybody that's got a female partner in the room, these are the things that women will go through and it's, it's quite a challenging, difficult space. So the, the impact of that hormone deficiency causes brain fog. Uh, the ones that are in red are the ones that I experience particularly. Brain fog, weight gain, lack of concentration, depression and low mood, loss of libido, jo joint and muscle pain, memory lapses. And suddenly the ability to spin a zillion plates became very, very difficult because biochemically we're not as able to do it irregular heartbeat I was diagnosed with that I'm going to get on to the diagnosis so I basically got to May 20, uh, 2020 and I had thrombophlebitis that's like a superficial blood clotting I went to the hospital and they said oh don't worry you've not had a DVT I'd had a previous DVT back in 2007 post a ski accident they said it's all right it's just superficial and I said well what's the likelihood of that getting worse oh no it should be okay six weeks later I get some niggly sort of pain in my calf and I think, that's not right. It's not a calf strain. I'm going to get... But of course it was COVID, wasn't it? So you couldn't get an appointment at the doctor's and uh, off I went to the hospital and was diagnosed with DVT. But at that point when everybody's saying, you're not doing too well, I just continued working with my DVT. It's fine. I can manage. I can cope really well. And then a few months later, I... Uh, ended up with this irregular heartbeat and ended up in hospital again. Now my heart rate was over 200 with no, I was sat in a, in a meeting online and my heart rate went up to 200. And I thought, and, and really I hadn't taken the advice completely from the medical practitioners around resting whilst I was having this DVT. I was only supposed to be walking and I was using my exercise bike because I was obese and because I wanted to make sure that I was burning enough calories to try and mitigate some of the other, you know, health factors going on in my life. So I was quite worried at this point because my heart rate had gone up to 200. Ended up in hospital. Yeah, you've got superventricular tachycardia. But then they, because of COVID, it was like, yeah, you need to have a 48 hour ECG and you need all these different interventions. Um, but we can't do it straight away. You're going to have to wait to have that test done. So that was just like another thing really for me in the, in the whole mix. Um, but I just kept on working. I've now got one chief inspector. I've been given a chief inspector at this point. So I wasn't completely without a team. But Paul will testify. He came to my office one day and he said, you know, he said to me recently, he said, I'll never forget the day I came to your office and you were just, you just looked ill, you looked in a mess, and you were, I don't know what, whether I'm you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's told me this, he's told me this recently. He said, it was crazy, didn't you? Yeah. And you were just living in that space all the time. And, and other people could see it. They could see that I was, but I wasn't taking any notice because, guess what? We quite often don't take any notice, do we? We just keep going. So the tox of my mixy, my mix of unhealthy lifestyle components, I'm just going to share those. So the poor nutrition, not eating, eating the wrong things, eating irregularly, eating the wrong things at the wrong times. Those are all part of it. Spinning too many plates, inside and outside work, inability to say no, trying to please everyone. How many of us in the room are always trying to please people? Come on, we are. This is the truth. You know, I've learned a massive, I mean, I could do a talk just on people pleasing Paul and how, how to get out of that space because it's really important that you do get out of that space for you and for your well being. And not for selfish reasons, but for real reasons. So, poor sleep, terrible sleep. There was probably a few reasons for that. 
minimal downtime and rest. I never rested. I just never rested. I was always on the go. Apart from when I was sat in meetings with my Lego, <laughs> Lego, you know, that, that, I suppose that was rest in terms of, you know, when we were working online stuff. Excessive workload demands and feelings of obligation to others. I put here a little mindfulness prayer meditation, whatever you think about any of those things. I'm a Christian, so prayer is part of that life and meditation is if I ever sit still. Um, but meditation is actually very powerful and very good whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, it actually really helps your nervous system to calm down and to come into that place of rest. And uh, I'll use a big word, homeostasis, so that nice balance really. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute for the tools. Exercising too intensely, too frequently. Now, who would have ever thought that I would stand up here and say that with all the exercise that I love to do and have loved to do all of my life, really? I exercised to thrash myself every single time I did a workout. Do you know what? That is the worst thing you can do, both for your nervous system and both for your overall fitness and health. When you work out, you should work out and have an integrated approach to working out. So you might do one or two hit sessions a week, but actually the other sessions should be mixed. Uh, and I'll talk about how that impacts on how healthy, you know, how much healthier you can become if you do that right. And then increase in alcohol consumption for any reason and most reasons. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well in a minute. And I was always in a rush. Rush, 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 rush. Rush on the nervous system is really unhealthy. It, it's terrible. There's a book called Rushing Woman Syndrome. Because I don't think you men rush quite as much. No, I don't know. You don't seem to anyway. But I think us ladies have definitely got more of an issue with that. And I, I don't know what that's to do with. Any men feel really rushed all the time? Not as much, or you do, or you find your female partner's rushing you. Come on, get out the door, love. <laughs> anyway, rushing is not good. So, now what happened? So I've told you a few bit about the physical symptoms. I want to just show you this chart here, because I use, who uses a Garmin? Anybody use a Garmin watch? Does it, do you have the um, stress and heart rate variability readings on there? You don't know, okay. So if you've got a Garmin watch that measures, has got heart rate variability, it will measure your stress level, your sleep level. And if you've got a, a more recent model, it will also mod me measure a thing called body battery, which is very interesting. And that's all about how you recharge, <laughs> literally. How do you recharge overnight? How do you recharge to be good for the next day? Um, how did burnout and acute perimenopausal stress manifest for me. I've talked about the physical symptoms. I lacked energy. I wasn't sleeping well. I had the thrombophlebitis, the blood clot, the SVT. I felt, felt disorientated a lot of the time. I was losing confidence. I was doing stuff, forgetting things, brain fog, all that kind of th stuff. And I felt like I was becoming dysfunctional. And then the more dysfunctional you begin to feel, the more it's a bit like a, a vicious circle. And then that impacts on your emotions. I mean, I, I'll say that I was close to tears emotionally a lot of the time. You know, over some things that pretty much, you know, I look back on now quite stupid. So at the point that I actually reported unfit for work, I, I can remember um, going out a couple of days afterwards for a bike ride. And I left my uh, wallet and my puncture stuff on the front bonnet of my car. And I just, you know, I, just, I would cry about stuff like that, which, you know, now I just think, stupid, dippy individual. That's <laughs> not so cow. But, you know, things that, things that, you know, you could laugh at, probably, historically, suddenly were like the biggest crisis and the worst thing in the world. It was like everything was blown out of all proportion and I'll never forget the day that I finally accepted that I wasn't well and I was on the call to one of these or on the phone to one of these two senior police officer friends and uh, she said to me this friend of mine said to me um you really aren't well Maria and I think you need to take some time off and I said oh, I'm going to take a rest day in Lou today <laughs> She said, no, I'm not talking about you taking a rest day in lieu. I'm talking about you going sick. And I said, well, I haven't got a broken leg. And, you know, I think I'll be all right in a few days. And she said, no. She said, you really are not well. 
and you need so I mean I've been crying down the phone I wasn't it was clear I wasn't well really but you know anyway but the point that I actually went I'm not well was was like it felt like defeat at some level and suddenly the next sort of 48 hours that followed it felt like this which had been so important to me for 27 or 26 years it was then suddenly was being taken away and all the value that I felt in who I was as a police officer I know it's probably maybe this sounds stupid but for me that was a massive thing and at that point I didn't think that I was ever going to be well enough to ever pick it back up again and be able to do my job because I felt such a mush, a mess. <laughs> and I just thought, how am I, you know, if I can't even manage really basic things, how am I going to ever go back to work? So I, uh, it was, yeah, it was horrible. It was a really horrible time. That first, I'd say the first four to six weeks were really horrible because it, ha it forced me then to come back to or what is actually important in life? You know, actually, if I'm not well and I can't look after my health properly, well, what am I going to give at work anyway? So that whole being valued and that sense of being valued, you know, my value being so much in, in what I did, that's another thing that I would really throw out there and say to you all today, yes, we love our roles in policing and they are, you know, most of us, I'm probably pretty confident to say that most of us have have been police officers all this time or wherever we are in our service as police staff members because we passionately believe in what we're doing and why we're doing it. But there comes a point where if it becomes what defines you, then you're in a really risky space because for whatever reason, it could be taken away at any moment and then suddenly you're left with, I mean, you know, I'd say, oh, my faith was really important. My faith was really important. but. My purpose and my mission was to be in the police. That was my, my calling, you know, that's how I felt. So to suddenly have that taken out of the equation was, was, was quite painful. I know some people would go, oh great, I'm, I'm off work, that's fantastic. That was not how I felt. Um, and actually, it was almost like, well, where do I, how do I, how do I get better? And I, I remember sitting and writing a list of all these things that I was going to do to make myself better, which is just so funny looking back on it. Because then I got the, um, the call from Occupational Health and I ended up having some counselling. And I can remember having this first conversation with um, Henrietta and saying to her, well, if I do this, this and this, that will fix this, this and this. It was like I thought I could just fix it just in a couple of weeks. But unfortunately, it wasn't the sort of thing that you can fix in a couple of weeks. And I guess depending on what, you know, what the circumstances are that surround, you know, you come into the point where you hit that burnout and you hit that end of the road will depend on what, um, how quickly you get better. It also, I think, depends on how much you invest into the key things I'm going to highlight. And you've said some of the key things already about the things that keep us well and make us well and help us to stay well. But I also felt like, oh, I've become one of those people that I used to say, come on, pull yourself together. What's wrong with you? Pull yourself together. You know, we often look at people like that that are in that space of depression, anxiety, um, stress, stress on the sick record. Oh, you know, what's wrong with them? Blimmin, mean, pull yourself together. I, I, I definitely was in that space. Pull yourself together. But until it happens to you, then it's right in your experience then that really changes your kind of focus on it. I share this chart because we are designed to deal with stress and a good amount, uh, there's a healthy amount of stress. It helps us perform. So, you know, stress when you're working out, that's good. It's just when you overload your system. And so there is a fine balance. You can see that they shared this on the um, Harrogate course, psychological wellbeing course that I went on just after I'd come back to work. And I thought, well, I'll be really useful to share that with lots of people. Actually, loads of people in the organisation need to see this chart. If you're in that space where there's no stress, you're lame. So you're not going to be delivering any real meaningful sort of performance. So you need some level of stress to bring you up to that peak performance place. But you'll see there's a very fine balance when you get to that peak performance. And we're not going to talk about this in detail today, but we certainly could on another day, Paul 
where you can get pushed into the fatigue space. Now, if you don't start to address the issues in the fatigue space, so if I go back in my kind of lead up period, if I'd gone back to sort of, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe two years before actually, probably 2018 was when there were some warning bells for me, but I didn't really t pay attention. Perhaps if I'd gone back there and actually tried to put the, the measures in place at that point, I might not have ended up in the disease space, which is where I ended up for sure. So you hit the exhaustion, then you hit the panic, anxiety and anger. And remember, hormonally, as ladies particularly, we've got the hormone balance going on, so it will push us more into this space more easily. So we do need to manage that, and there does need to be awareness with line managers and leaders around it. And men go through something called andropause sometimes as well, um, which I don't know a lot about, but it isn't just females. It's just that we have, it's just that all females will go through it. Females make a big part of the workforce up, and we're all gonna hit it at some point in our middle age. So what now? Well, this is how it felt. I landed in out of Mongolia without an interpreter, a roadmap, or anyone to talk to, talk me through what's next. This was an alien place at my 27 years in police service. I had no clue what was going on, why it happened, why I felt like I wanted to jump in the, the water park every time I went for a walk around it. Um, I felt totally disorientated, and I've talked through some of that already. I reassessed what's important and only say no, and I developed a new pattern, but recognised there wasn't any quick, quick fix. Slept, I slept every day. Once I could sleep properly, which took about two to three weeks, I slept every day between nine and sometimes even 12 hours. My, I was absolutely exhausted, and that sleep went on for nearly four months. In fact, at one point, a very good friend said to me, I don't know what you're going to do. You can't sleep that long when you come back to work, you know. <laughs> I said, I'm sure it'll level itself out. But I would sleep and sleep and sleep. And obviously the Garmin said some great stuff about what my sleep was now doing. But the way your body repairs itself, the way your brain repairs itself is sleep. That's the way we're made. Uh, I focused on nutrition. I did some exercise, but I changed my exercise kind of rhythm. Meditation and prayer. Um, I also wanted answers, so I did the whole, you know, I did DNA tests, I did gut adrenal gland tests, spent a lot of money, probably two grand, trying to unpick. Now, you know, one of these friends will say, oh yeah, but you always, you're going to find out, you're going to go to the nth degree to get all the answers you want, and she's right. So I did do all those things. And then I also did a 30-day alcohol experiment, experiment, I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but there's an author called Annie Grace who's written um, a book. She runs, she's got this massive community sort of globally, runs coaching courses, uh, written quite a lot of books. But there's a, the Alcohol Experiment is a 30-day app you can download on your phone or you can do um, their, their live alcohol experiment, which is hosted on an internet platform. Now, in that, you take what you try to do, I'll say you try to do, is that people do it and they don't always do it, but they try to take a 30-day break from drinking. And we always talk about dry January. But the difference with this approach is that over the 30 days, you're not just pressing into the whole willpower, right, I'm not gonna have a drink today and I'm not all the way through the 30 days. You are really re-educating yourself around alcohol. I'm gonna share some bits about alcohol in a minute because that was definitely one of my toxic factors. I'd got into some bad patterns around that. And when I look back, you know, I didn't drink at all when I joined the police. So you have to ask the question, I hardly drank at university. The church context that I was in wasn't a big, it's the people have a glass of wine in that, but the police culture was one that certainly baptized me into the, we drink. We drink a lot. And I actually decided, I think at some point, I'm going to get good at this so that when I go out, I'm never going to get drunk. I'm going to have a really good tolerance level so I can drink a bottle of wine. It's no problem at all. Then I look like I'm still fitting in with everybody, fitting in, just, you know, socialising, all of that kind of stuff. But before I knew it, at some point down on this, on this trajectory, it's become an issue because now I'm, I want to stop, but now it's a little bit more difficult to stop. So... And we'll talk about why that is as a sec. No stigmas with that. But I did the alcohol experiment and I did stop. 
and I didn't drink. And that was great. And then I really tried to rebuild all the key things. So um, this is an analogy that my counsellor gave me, which I really like. She talks about being in the stable, then being in the field, being in the paddock, getting to the starting gate. You're trying to build little building blocks all the time as you're going through this journey of kind of recovery. Um, and sometimes you'll, you'll push yourself in a direction, but actually it's too much at that point in time. And you just have to take the step back, go back to the paddock, just chill out a bit. And it, and it did take quite a long time. You know, I kept thinking, oh, I'll be back at work by February, but I wasn't back at work by February, but I wasn't ready to come back to work in February. And actually uh, in February, I still wasn't sure whether I was gonna be able to work. So, you know, I had to keep moving the boundaries a little bit, but then I eventually uh, came back to work in the April time. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a sec. I had to stop. That was the long and short of it. It, I had to stop, I had to reset, I had to recalibrate. And that meant taking care of all the little things. I'm gonna talk through the four pillars in a minute. But these happiness chemicals, so, so you're in this state of up and down and all over the place. I started, I refused antidepressants and not, there's no, uh, you know, uh, aspersion on anybody that takes antidepressants for anxiety or for, sorry, for medication for anxiety or for antidepressants. But what I discovered in my journey was actually it was about my hormone balance that was out of sync. And actually the doctors want to prescribe antidepressants wrongly to a lot of females that are in the perimenopausal state when actually what they need is the right balance of hormones. So they need some estrogen and some of us need some testosterone. So um, I refused and had big run-ins with the GP and then eventually went to the menopause doctor and paid a lot of money to get the help that I needed the Newson Health Clinic. Not a lot of money, but you know, you had to pay for it. It should be something that women can get. I'm a superintendent, I could afford to pay for it. Some people that are frontline officers probably can't afford to pay for it, which is uh, why it needs to be addressed. So happiness chemicals and how to get them. These are four happiness chemicals which help our brain balance. And these are the different ways of getting them. So dopamine, eating, there you go. Achieving a goal, getting enough sleep, having a bath, those are things that would help you with that. Oxytocin, the love hormone, they call that. Socialising, physical touch, petting animals, helping others. <laughs> during, uh, during lockdown though, we didn't get a lot of that, did we? So that was quite hard because I was unwell during the whole lockdown sp space. And I didn't really want to socialise. I mean, I'm an extrovert. I did not want people. And there was about four people, five people, that was it, that I would talk to during that space, during that time. And then endorphins, you know, exercising, laughing, listening to music and serotonin. They are really important in our lives. I should put that slide up there because this is part of making sure that you have, have a healthy balance in your life. Your brain chemistry is affected by so many different things. And if it's getting pressed in the stress space, these are things that will help with rebalancing it and rebalancing it in a natural way. These were the four pillars that I really worked on. And I think Annie shouted most of them out at the beginning about things that impact our nervous system. So nutrition, lumen, I'm gonna mention that in a second. S managing stress, sleep, and activity levels. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about lumen. So at the point that I went sick, I was 93 kilos, 209 pounds. I was just into the obese category, and I saw this advert on Facebook. I'm clearly at one of those, you know, marketing dreams, aren't I? I saw this advert on Facebook for this little device called Lumin, and um, this is the device. And this device basically measures what they call respiratory exchange rate, which is the level of carbon dioxide in your breath. And the level of carbon dioxide in your breath is an indicator of what your body is using for energy at any one time. So from uh, one to five, you can be purely fat burning, mainly fat burning, three is burning fats and carbs, four is burning mainly carbs, and five is burning just carbs. And um, I thought, well, I, you know, I've tried everything else. Been on and off diets my whole life. You know, I've always struggled with weight gain from being a teenager. So I just thought, well, you can send it back after 30 days. And it, it just happened that it arrived about a week before I came off what I reported unfit for work. 
basically gives you a daily plan. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures in a minute of how it works. But I work with this device every single day. It gave me a nutrition plan every day. It wasn't a crazy nutrition plan. It wasn't like you've got to starve yourself. It was a, a plan that basically added up to around 1,650 calories a day, which is not a starvation plan, is it? And, uh, but I think what, one of the things that stands out about this is actually how it helps your overall cellular health in terms of that doesn't, but following the nutrition plans helps your overall cellular health. So it gave you high carb days, low carb days, and it gave you a you know, plan around what sort of foods are good. And that, of course, led me to do my own research about nutrition. I could do a whole hour on just on nutrition and how that affects brain chemistry, how that affects energy levels, how that affects moods. What you eat, you are what you eat. It affects so much. And I don't think you know, I had that kind of understanding before uh, getting the device and before doing all the research. The next thing that I really focused in on was stress, managing stress. And I showed you at the very beginning, you saw that chart, the Garmin chart, how it went down. That was where I started to manage the stress properly. And the good thing about that is that 12 months after returning to work, my stress levels have stayed at that good level because I now have tools in all of these areas to make sure that I do get the rest that I need that I do prioritise my sleep, that I do prioritise what I eat. I mean, it sounds really basic. Probably you lot are all doing that, and that's why you haven't been ill. <laughs> but, but I know that watching police officers around where I work, I'm not talking about the boss. I know he came today, but I, I'm not talking about him. He, he eats very healthily. <laughs> but people don't eat. People don't eat at work, and then they eat the nearest thing. And that's what I used to do. I remember in CT, I never really planned what I was going to eat, and then I'd just grab. You saw me eating a load of noodles that day. I would just eat whatever. I'd get really hungry. You know, call it intermittent fasting, whatever. It wasn't really intermittent fasting. It was just, I hadn't planned my food. So, you know, it wasn't healthy. Um, what else? Exercise, fresh air, the menopause doctor. She was really important in helping me with the, managing the stress levels. Listening to my body, eliminating alcohol and reducing caffeine. Why did I reduce caffeine? I did a test, uh, an adrenal gland test, and the day that I did the test, you had to have no caffeine at all, none, I know. And I thought, oh, that'll be easy for a day. <coughs> oh my goodness. Come nine o'clock at night when I had to do my last saliva sample, <coughs> I was climbing the walls. And what was really interesting was, that when I got the results of the test and when I looked at the Garmin readings the next day, my stress levels were on the floor. I woke up with a stress level of five, which is like barely on the scale. And I thought, man, that, and, and actually I haven't given up caffeine, but I have reduced it. So don't ha I usually try and have only two cups of real tea and one coffee a day. And then I do decaf. Decaf hasn't got zero in it, but caffeine really affects our nervous systems. So um, I tried to cut that down as well. Monitoring stress levels, so checking that out. It's really interesting when you see how different circumstances impact your stress levels. You think that a big workout, that'll, you know, you might cause stress afterwards. Mm -mm. Actually, if you exercise at a moderate or low intensity, minimal sort of stress. And what I would say, having learnt this this week, and I'm about to release a YouTube video on this, is that actually presenting like this actually causes more stress. So Wes and Annie, your Garmin readings later on today and your body battery will really sink because actually it, it requires more emotional energy and emotional energy and mental energy actually drains our stores, our battery, <laughs> a lot quicker than uh, physical. I was quite surprised about that. Uh, and then I had all these ologists, cardiologists. I had an ECG for a month, uh, which, you know, I went back to the doctor I did two ECGs in the period that I was off. The first one was in October and the second one was in February. And when I went for my return appointment, the first thing he said was, oh, I didn't recognize you. So I was 15 kilos lighter when I walked in. And then he said, I can't believe the results of this ECG. Your ECG, you have totally turned around this, what was a serious superventricular tachycardia issue by your change in lifestyle, your nutrition, you're getting rid of alcohol, you're doing all these healthy things. He said, you've, you've turned around a condition we were about to do an intervention on based on the previous result. So 
it worked it works uh, sleep I did lots of that lots and lots and lots and, and, and measured it and looked at it and, value. and I still do I still monitor my sleep so if I know that I'm on a deficit like last week I had some friends coming to stay and I was really looking forward to them coming to stay but come Thursday we'd had this long away day I hadn't got home from work till nine o'clock and I was thinking tomorrow night I'm not going to be staying out late because I need my bed I need my sleep and they weren't very happy about this but then I had a fantastic night's sleep <laughs> Thursday night woke up feeling brilliant on Friday morning and actually had totally recharged and re-energized so it is really about learning what works for you and how you can you know make sure you monitor what's going on even if you're not using this go by how you feel if you're feeling rubbish make sure you prioritize that next sleep session and then I changed my approach to activity and I have talked a little bit about that as we've gone along so I took out some of those really intense workouts went to strength training got muscle mass that I've never had in my life and um, and did a lot of lower intensity cardio uh, with a couple of higher ones mixed in occasionally. So I've talked a little bit about Lumen. This is just some of the pictures. So this is what it gives you. So these are the measurements when you wake up and the aim is to wake up in fat burn because when you sleep, you want your body to be using fat for fuel because it is a slow breakdown. It's a slow fuel. So when you're sleeping, it uh, is the best fuel to be using and is also an indicator of metabolic health. So you take measurements whenever you want. You have to take your morning measurement. That is the most important measurement of the day and that gives you the nutrition plan for the day. So, and then you, you're off. The DNA test, um, just a quick thing on that. So genetic predisposition. So I definitely had got genes as well that were against me. I got a, a gene that said I was unlikely to ever be persistently thin <laughs> and my waist circumference was likely to be larger and stress-related obesity was also a raised risk because when you're stressed your body holds on to fat did you know that when you don't sleep your body holds on to fat and actually if there's two things that people omit from you know when they want to try and lose weight Everybody talks about calorie deficit. Calorie deficit is important. Clearly, you need to use more calories than you're taking in. However, hormone balance, emotions, gut microbiome, stress, sleep, liver function, thyroid function, all impact on your ability to use and burn fat stores up. Um, and my DNA wasn't, wasn't great. Um, at all in fact it was very it didn't surprise me it was like oh well and I said to my mum it must be you that gave me that because my mum's always struggled with her way <laughs> rather than my dad um, but all those things are really important and uh, the test also gave me loads of data about cancer and other stuff which some people wouldn't want to know I guess but in the space that I was in so it gives you a, like a risk factor around whether you you might be at a high risk to have cancer I'm at a higher risk for Alzheimer's so actually having HRT is really helpful because if you don't have HRT as a woman, you raise your risk of Alzheimer's basically. It's, it's, you raise your risk around your brain function because estrogen deficiency basically impacts three things majorly, bone health, brain health, and heart health. So if you, if you don't, get the estrogen that you're lacking when you start to lose producing it naturally you put yourself at a greater risk of those things power of the brain not thinking so although you might have a genetic predisposition your genetic expression does not have to line up with that so I might have had a waist circumference slightly larger but I'm now defying that because your lifestyle choices can help your genetic expression be something different and dr caroline leaf talks all about that in her book uh switch on your brain i've got some resources at the end you can have a look at really good book around your brain and she does a brain detox which is really good and then dr daniel amen is a book that i'm listening to at the moment on audible he has written a book called change your brain change your body and that's all about how you optimize you know your brain type to help change your body too so there's a lot about the way you think and your mindset I could again I could talk about that it's a separate kind of session 
Gut microbiome, really important. The gut's the second brain. Who's heard about that? Who's heard that the gut is the second brain? Few of you have. The, it is. So if your gut microbiome health is not great, then that means your immune system's likely to be, uh, you're likely to have a lower response immune-wise. So I did all that. I did the gut test, and then I had protocol supplements. I was gluten-free for six months. I wanted to get everything sorted out so that when I came back to work, I was a full tank, not a half full tank or an empty tank. Okay, let's talk about alcohol. Why do we think we like to drink? Well, you know, all these reasons are good reasons we might think. Relaxes us and helps us unwind, uh, helps us switch off and detach from work and the difficult things we face, all that trauma and stress. It numbs us. That's one of the reasons, I think. And, you know, how many times have you heard people say, oh, I've earned a drink? We treat it like a reward. We reward ourselves with it. And yet, I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute, which will show you why it's not a reward. <laughs> uh, it gives us a nice warm feeling. We lose our inhibitions. It helps us sleep. It gives us a buzz. It's our go-to. All these different reasons. And all these reasons have been kind of placed there because of the society that we live in, because of marketing. How many people didn't drink very much when they joined the police? Was I the only one? How many people don't drink at all? other than me and Anthony and Pervez. Okay, we're the only three in the room. Wow. Everybody else drinks. Do you, I'm going to ask you a question then. Do you drink more to now than you did 20 years ago? Because yeah. Okay. That's, that's a telling, that's a question, that's a question everybody should ask themselves. Because the, um, the, the place that we get addicted to it and then want it every day how do you know when you hit that place it's very difficult to know when you hit that place I didn't know I'd hit that place I was definitely I, I got to a place where I was drinking every day except when I was on call but but I got to that place of daily drinking and not just daily drinking a bottle of wine when I was able to I could easily drink a bottle of wine that didn't did not do the fix for me didn't hit didn't flick the switch because I got used to it I'd expose my brain and my muscle memory. So, this is what it does to your stress levels when you're in that space. This was whilst I was away skiing in January 2020, similar time to when I showed you that picture. So, 53, right, so my stress level at the moment, my average stress level now is between 20 and 30 every day. 54. And if you notice, during the night time, it's, it doesn't come down, does it? It's just orange. That is what it was like 40 days after I'd stopped consuming alcohol at all. And I'll do the sleep one. So that same stress picture, that's what the sleep picture looked like. Five hours, hardly any deep, hardly any REM sleep. And then another one from the next day. Bit, a bit length, a bit better, but no REM sleep and no and 49 minutes deep sleep. So it massively impacts your sleep. So when people say, oh, alcohol helps me deal with stress, you might think it's helping you deal with stress in the, mo in the moment. In your, in your kind of thinking, your thoughts might think you're hel it's helping you deal with stress. But actually, what it is doing physically to your nervous system is not helping you deal with stress. In fact, what it's doing is it's actually raising your stress levels. So that was the picture of sleep and stress after 40 days on the... I, actually, the alcohol experiment was 30 days, but I just kept going after that because I'd read this book called This Naked Mind and I'd actually read some of their resources 18 months previously and then I'd, you know, kind of gone back to what I would call the moderating space. But then the moderating space started to increase. And once the perimenopausal symptoms kicked in, I needed to know what is perimenopausal and what is alcohol? What's, what's going on here with my system? What is going on that is contributing to my low mood anxiety? I want to know what is, I, I want to isolate perimenopause. And I can't do that at the moment because I know that alcohol, because alcohol affects your mood and your brain chemistry as well. So I, I had to take it out. So what happens? Basically, it causes an artificial stimulation of the pleasure hormone in the brain for 20 to 30 minutes. You get that buzz, don't you? Where do you get a buzz? Well, you get a buzz 
if you don't drink too much regularly, because sometimes you need more than a glass to get you the buzz. So you might actually need to be second drink before you start to get the buzz. But then, because it is an artificial stimulation, and I'm, I differentiate it from alcohol, from uh, so exercise, because exercise naturally stimulates pleasure in the brain. The brain is very clever, and it reduce, it releases this uh, depressant hormone. That's why we say that alcohol is a stimulant and a depressant. It releases a depressant hormone called dynorphin, which makes you feel, oh, I need another drink. You know. We, we rarely drink one drink as police officers, in my experience. I rarely drank one drink. So the brain's very clever with that to stimulate it. And then with the exposure, the quantity, the frequency, it becomes a habit. When I look back over my journey, you know, I tried to work out when was it that I started to get into the bad habit? You know, was it when I was running murder investigations as an SIO? Was it the way that I came home from work and this was the way that I just tuned out the post-mortem that I'd just gone to, the trauma that I'd just seen, the victims that were, you know, terribly distressed because they were bereaved. Was it, was that, was it then? Was that when I started to, you know, increase? Or was it when I was a fin, when I couldn't sleep because I'd reached my 40s and I used to come home from work and have a glass of wine to help me go to sleep? And when I started to think about it, I thought, well, I don't actually know when it was. But at some point in my, you know, we said we don't drink less now than we did 20 years ago. At some point in that journey, it's just increased in the background. And, you know, I can remember being on courses, police courses, and it was always, you know, to the bar. And I was the one I used to organise, you know, I used to make sure we got plenty of supplies, even on ski trips. I'd be the one that'd take the Prosecco in the ski boot so that when we got to the ski resort we'd got plenty of Prosecco everybody was then encouraged to bring a bottle of Prosecco in their ski boot so that we all had got Prosecco for the hot tub you know and there's loads of pictures that keep coming up in my Facebook of me sat there in the hot tub with the Prosecco I don't know when for me it became so much of a habit that my muscle memory and my brain started to learn it was necessary because at some point what happens is your brain then thinks it's necessary and then it is more difficult to say, right, I'm going to stop. So I suppose from all of that, what I would say is, um, and this is the medical kind of slide, is it's really important to set boundaries. And, you know, if you want to drink moderate, I'm not standing here today to expecting you all to go teetotal at the end of this session by any stretch of the imagination. But what I am saying today is it is something that you want to consider. It is something... That you, that you probably need to reflect on at some point because I, I with 28 years service, wished I could have told my younger self at five years service when I thought this was just great fun and we, we're having a great time and this is all good, that actually, do you know what? Keeping some boundaries around it and, and treating it with the respect would have been a better course of action. The reality is now I'm so healthy, I don't even want it and I wouldn't want it because I don't have any... I don't have any desire for it. It doesn't give me any benefit. And um, I suppose because I've read such a lot and I understand how it works, you know, it, it's not something that I miss at all. Um, the other things, I suppose, are the medical things as well. Um, you know, the impact on cancer, the impact on brain health. Do you know that it takes your liver 30 days to reset after any amount of alcohol? So if you're trying to lose weight, actually your metabolism is really messed up by, by that. So enough on that, I think I've, I've hit that uh, subject. But it was an important part of me getting really healthy. Um, getting this right, we're all different. Gradual re-immersion into the workspace. I was really fortunate I was afforded a gradual re-immersion into the workspace and I worked on a project when I first came back to work. I couldn't go back into the role that I'd been in. There was a reason for that and the main reason for that was um, muscle memory actually um, for me because I couldn't put myself back in the space where I had become really really unwell and we are all different and that might work for some people and not for others I needed something fresh so that I could rebuild recover in the work I'd recovered enough to come back into the workplace but now I needed to recover in the workplace and if I'd gone back into the context that I've been in there was too much association there was too much 
stuff around the circumstances that would have made it repeat and replay. And I'd have been in an anxious space thinking about all of that instead of thinking about how am I now going to take steps forward? You know, how am I now going to make sure that I recover fully? So I did that role, transition role. And I think it's really important because when we think about people that we manage, you know, we almost need to be affording them the choice. And I have raised this with the wellbeing team and occupational health that we almost need to, when people have been in this space where they've really crashed, we need to try and help facilitate them back. It might be that they do something different for a bit. I could go back now, a year on, I could go back into the environment that I was in before, but that's because I'm well now. And actually when I came back to work, I wasn't fully 100%. And I think Ian will, you know, he's in the room today. I'm sure he would say the difference in me from when he first met me in the coffee shop uh, to say welcome to Sandwell back in August last year to how I am probably from December, January time, it took that amount of time to actually fully get well enough. You know, to stand, I was nowhere to be able to stand up here and talk about it back then, would I? <laughs> no. So it's really important to, it's really important to reintegrate people um, in a way that is going to work for them. And I think sometimes we don't reintegrate people that well. I think I was very fortunate. I don't think everybody is so fortunate, but I just encourage you to think about people that you line manage, whatever their circumstances are, how you reintegrate them in and give them confidence again, because the confidence thing was massive. I was so nervous in every single context when I came back to work. It was like being the new girl all over again. It was, it was a long time, nearly. it was almost, it wasn't quite six months, but it was nearly six months. And you've got all of those psychological things to get over. Now I'm here, you know, I'm confident, I've got this YouTube channel, I've got lots of things going on. And I'm, um, <coughs> and I'm confident talking about the journey because I've learned so much, I've read so much. It's all science-based. There's nothing that I've shared today that isn't kind of backed up by what any books will tell you. Um, so it's really important. So that's a, that was a little picture of me in Turkey. I did get that holiday. I did get to my 50th birthday. I did get the holiday, but I crashed after the holiday. About, it was about a month after the holiday because the reality was I hadn't changed any of the things and I didn't actually have the, the warning signs. So in terms of, you know, physical, mental, emotional transformation. Um, it, it's been quite uh, incredible. And yeah, I still struggle. You know, some of the gynecological issues are issues still, and they're not gone, because I'm still in that space. And those of us that are in that space know that at the moment, treatment and medication is at a shortage. So that's creating a bit of anxiety, trying to get it. I left Tesco's last night and the woman said, don't get mugged on your way out with those three Easter gels. <laughs> I mean, that's how short it is at the moment. I said, don't worry, I'm going to Mallorca soon. I'll buy some and I'll be, and she'll sell it on eBay. <laughs> so um, it's been uh, quite a journey. It's nice to have a metabolic age of 44. Sorry, I have gone on, Paul.